Members, fellows, guests of the Academy, it's a privilege to share with you a few thoughts on the future of our profession. I have no financial conflicts of interest to disclose. My financial interests are the same as everyone's in this room, to do well individually by doing the best for patients and community. Paul Sternberg has beautifully articulated the joys and the opportunities associated with the profession of ophthalmology. He's also alluded to some of the challenges we face. We are in transition from a knowable present to a very uncertain future. And this will not be a tidal ebb and flow, but a deluge of economic, social, and regulatory imperatives transforming our professional lives. Some of these changes are good for patients and for physicians, some are not. We're moving from pure fee-for-service to multifaceted reimbursement schemes, poorly defined and poorly understood. We're seeing physicians, hospitals, and payers form integrated multi-billion dollar systems. We're going from purely physician-directed care to team-based care with the patient as an integral member of that team. Some areas are witnessing an acceleration of retail medicine and concierge medicine. Twice as many Americans used a retail clinic in 2012 as in 2009. Finally, cost-independent clinical decisions are being replaced by value-driven interventions where cost and quality are both prime factors. Notably, over the past six years, the percent of employers who offered high deductible health plans increased from 10% to 38%. The significance of this value-based payment trend is echoed in an editorial from a recent issue of the New England Journal of Medicine. Perhaps the only health policy issue on which Republicans and Democrats agree is the need to move from volume-based to value-based payment. The aspirational goal is to pay for outcomes that take into account quality and costs. All of us who spend some time inside the Beltway would agree that that's the prime driver. As physician patients, we would do the same. If we needed complex, expensive surgery and were paying for it out of pocket, we'd first seek a surgeon with outstanding outcomes. And if there were more than one option, we'd certainly take cost into account. The authors then state, the practical reality is that CMS, despite heroic efforts, cannot accurately measure any physician's overall value now or in the foreseeable future. Tragically, as we all know, that won't stop them from putting a system in place. There's a common thread interweaving all of these trends, large data sets. Decisions regarding system participation, payments, and access to patients will be based on data showing how we practice and the outcomes of our practices referenced against our peers and against evidence-based clinical guidelines. Unfortunately, the only data out there is their data a virtual black box. Having light at the end of the data tunnel will require that we as ophthalmologists have our own accurate information derived from a large pool of clinically relevant data. With this information, we can reference ourselves against best practices. We will not only provide better care, but we'll be able to validate and demonstrate to others that we're doing so. We can advocate for our profession and our practices based on robust, unassailable data of our own. This is the IRIS registry, ophthalmology's moonshot. You'll hear more about this later in the opening session. Moonshot is not an inappropriate analogy. IRIS represents a massive professional challenge and is the product of some enormous human and organizational effort. IRIS is a comprehensive, longitudinal, outpatient-focused clinical data registry. By giving participating ophthalmologists confidential, 
real-time, comparative, and risk-adjusted portrayals of their practice processes and outcomes, it will promote practice improvement. It will also provide a mechanism to access incentive payments, to ease the complexities of maintenance of board certification and maintenance of state licensure, and to perform large registry-based clinical trials in a fraction of the time and cost. And it will provide the profession with information on the value of ophthalmic services that will be critical in advocating for our profession. How will it do this? With the power of big data. Already, the test centers have logged over 370,000 patient visits in the system. A very conservative estimate projects over 18 million patients in IRIS by 2016. Big data. Our future depends on knowing the value of the care we deliver as individuals and as a profession, the real costs, quality, outcomes, and impacts. And we will serve our patients best by using this data to improve the care we deliver. Patients, the employer community, and the payer community are coming to expect it. And if we don't provide it, we will have no control over the data by which we will be judged. For all of these reasons, you'll hear a lot about the IRIS registry at this meeting. And there's a very good reason. Your academy and the many talented colleagues who have brought the project to launch believe that IRIS offers us a brilliant and important vehicle to better fulfill our obligation to our patients and to exert better control over our professional destiny. IRIS is formally launching within four months. Through IRIS, your academy, not CMS, not United Healthcare, not your EMR company, will provide you with a unique resource to do well individually by doing the best for your patients and community. Thank you. To moderate the keynote panel on the Academy's newest initiative, the IRIS Registry, please welcome the Academy's Medical Director for Governmental Affairs, Dr. Michael X. Repka. Thank you. Good morning. A moonshot for ophthalmology? That seems like a high ledge to reach. Total practice improvement at no extra work Seems like these statements really deserve some questions, perhaps a few skeptical questions. Uh, the purpose of this panel is to open that discussion. We have a knowledgeable panel here this morning. They will be taking questions from the room, both by email and texting, and in fact from around the world through the virtual meeting. Uh, let me have the um, panel please come on. Uh, let's welcome the panel. Please welcome the chair of the Academy's Committee on Medical Information Technology, Dr. Michael Chang. The, advisor, the advisory member of the Hoskins Center for Quality Eye Care, Dr. Paul Lee. The chair of the Board of Governors for the College of Cardiology, Dr. David May. and the Academy's Medical Director for Health Policy, Dr. Bill Rich. Well, gentlemen, it sounds like we've raised quite a target for the organization. What do you think you would say, briefly, is one good reason why a busy ophthalmologist would want to participate in a registry? Michael, you're an early adopter of this technology, an information specialist. <clears throat> Well, I think that there are um, enormous opportunities, as Dr. Park laid out, to use this registry to improve the quality of patient care. Uh, the one thing that I'd point out to go beyond that is that um, as ophthalmologists and physicians, we're used to thinking about patient interactions one-on-one, uh, -on -one, one patient, one doctor. And really, the uh, registry gives us an opportunity to harness and go beyond that and really take advantage of the collective knowledge of a group of ophthalmologists around the world. And it's from that power that we can do things like uh, quality improvement and knowledge discovery. Uh, and so I think that to answer that question, um, 
the registry power improves exponentially as the number of people participating goes up. And so I think it's really that opportunity to contribute to that collective knowledge that's one of these uh, driving forces that we really need to emphasize. Before I go on to Paul, let me remind the audience that there are instructions for the mobile device on either end of the um, stage, at least um, posted for you. Simple texting. Paul? I view this as something that will help restore the joy that we all have in taking care of patients because we all got into the profession to do better and to help our patients and to do better as physicians. And so this is a powerful tool that will allow all of us who participate to learn from what we're doing and as Michael said, what our colleagues are doing so that we can always do better every day, every week, every year. So to me, it's a tool to restore part of the reason why we came into medicine in the first place. Yeah, but does this take time? So, so before I go on to time, I'm very concerned about that, and certainly people we've talked to are worried about workflow. But David, a cardiologist, has um, obviously used this in your practice in the past. What benefit have you seen as a practicing clinician for this? Well, what in the world is a cardiologist doing <laughs> on this panel? Uh, just in case an accident happens. Just in okay. case an accident yeah. happens. Uh, we have, as a professional organization, been engaging in outpatient registry data collection for some time. And let me assure you that three things will happen uh, with this participation. The first is that it will not take any additional time. You will learn very quickly that your workflow already accomplishes the data acquisition, and it's really just a matter of codifying it and collecting it. The second is you will engage the team that you work with far more than you have in the past. It's an amazing experience to see that take place. And the third is you will become very proud of the quality work that you do, because as soon as you begin to get reports back from the registry itself, you begin to make changes in your process, in your workflow, uh, and there is a dramatic improvement that takes place. The entire care team being very much excited about that. So the care team can actually see that change. It's that visible. Yeah, it is that visible and that quick, yes. I think the biggest uh, advantage is that we've, we're learning from other societies and other aspects, professional societies and other parts of society. Richard Deming in 1950 turned around the entire Japanese economy with a principle that was espoused a century before. If you measure something, you can improve. And the emphasis on quality leads to lower costs. And so I think that we're, we're approaching this at a seminal time. Not only can we have big amounts of data, not only can we shorten the timeline for improvement, it's pretty disgraceful that it takes 50% of docs 10 years to adopt randomized clinical trials into practice. This will facilitate the acquisition and the implementation on preferred guidelines very rapidly. Docs, when challenged and they looked at data, will improve just like retail services, just like the Japanese economy, were convinced. Great. So interesting. So, you know, I really don't like sending my data off to a... Um, third party, whether it be in the cloud, I mean, I'll send my stuff to Amazon or something like that, but um, you know, now we're sending clinical data. Who has access to it? Well, I think we can all comment on yeah. that, but so. it's okay to be paranoid, Michael. Uh, yeah. All right. Uh, so, Michael? Um, the data are stored in the cloud, and it's managed by a registry vendor who's really experienced in this and who's done it with cardiology for years now. Right. Uh, and so, the, there's an obvious concern that uh, you know, is my data going to be private? Who's got access to it? And uh, the answer to that is pretty simple, that the individual physician owns their own data. Okay, so the academy doesn't own it. Uh, the academy owns the collective, uh, the collective data. Uh, so I think that security and privacy are a really big concern. And I, I think one thing to remember about that is that uh, as physicians, um, we've always been a little bit vulnerable to that. And most of us are old enough to remember the days of uh, paper charts where anybody in a white coat could go into a hospital room and look at, uh, look at what's out there. And uh, I think it's also fitting that we're discussing this issue in New Orleans because uh, seven or eight years ago there was a huge hurricane and a lot of hospitals had their medical records permanently destroyed on paper. 
Uh, so security is a huge issue, but I think the good news is that we're working with a vendor who's really experienced in this, and um, individual doctors have access to their own data, and nobody else does. I think the other thing, isn't it true that uh, with the existence of your five or six registries, Society of Thoracic Surgery for 18 years, that data is, has not been discoverable. Isn't that true, David? That's correct. The data is yeah. not discoverable. Yeah. Yeah. So, so I, uh, just to reemphasize what Bill said, the uh, College of Cardiology has five registries. Seven. Four, seven registries okay. running, and they've done well for um, over a decade. Uh, what about, um, you know, some people in academic centers may be curious about if there's an IRB rule or something like that on registry data. Paul, what do you? The office of, uh, the appropriate office at CMS has given an opinion to the academy that this is considered the part of normal operations of the clinical, clinical operations and it is not researched and therefore an IRB is not required. It's clinical, it's actually quality improvement yeah. and it's exempted. So the quality improvement exception applies. Correct. Obviously if there's research being done then that would, within the registry, that would require some kind of IRB uh, review. Dave, are, are, is the research being done within the different uh, registries now? And, and that would require an IRB if a Pacific, Pacific research project. It depends, on, depends on the type of the project. Um, demographic uh, research on the outcomes uh, does not require that. Uh, you are able to actually simply apply with a research project to our registries. Uh, and if it's deemed an appropriate uh, a protocol, we simply acquire that data out of the registries for you. I think that IRIS, uh, which I must tell you I'm extraordinarily excited about, uh, this is the next generation of registry. Uh, this is not your father's registry by any stretch of the imagination, will allow you as a professional organization to move into that very rarefied atmosphere of the randomized trial done out of registry data participation that will require an IRB approach, but it will revolutionize the way that trials are done in the next decade. You know, certainly that was the call in JAMA uh, in the last few weeks. Yes. Let me turn to workflow. Uh, I, I think you know, some of the practical details of this, you know, we've sort of dealt with overarching clouds and things like that, but you know, I'm sitting in the office, I really don't want to get things in my way. Um, I really don't want to slow down. How do we make that happen? I think that's part of the, the, the entire technology. One of the tenets before, we've learned a lot from, from ACC and STS, and we owe them a lot. And some of the things that we learned is that this cannot interfere with workflow. Ophthalmologists are some of the most busy, pr productive professionals in medicine. And as a private practitioner, and we've learned historically that if the if it interferes with workflow, it's not going to happen. It will not get behind, as David calls them, the qualaholics. You have to have the participation of academe and private practice. And part of our mantra, given by the, uh, Dr. Park and the board, is this cannot interfere with workflow, and it won't. So how? What, what's the practical feature? I don't, you know, you've said that it doesn't stop me but how does it get there so it doesn't slow me down? I really can't hire another six techs. I can't even use an iPhone, so I'll defer to Michael. All right, so Michael, how's the data get in there? <laughs> well, in the older days, we used to use paper charts, and then registries wouldn't be feasible because somebody would have to sit and enter into a computer all the different data fields. Um, uh, but the benefit now is that as more and more of us are using electronic health records, uh, that data is already captured electronically. And by working with the registry, uh, we're developing methods to uh, map those EHR data to the registry so they can be collected uh, automatically. And I think that's the advance that makes these registries technically possible now, uh, whereas they weren't really practical uh, a decade ago because of the exact reasons you mentioned, Mike. Great. So let me remind the audience, we do have a um, text message access for questions for the panel. Uh, we'll be running for another 20 minutes or so. Um, so and how do, Michael, Paul. if I could just, you know, for the non-technical people in the audience like myself, part of the reason why I got so excited is that if you have an electronic health record, the data integrator, the company that we work with, will work with your IT staff and pull the data out of your health record. So you as a physician don't have to do much, if at all, any extra work. You just take care of your patients, you enter your data, and in the background, the data integrator will help work with your IT people to pull the information out. Exactly. All right, so, so that raises the question you're about probably to answer. Well, I think that uh, 
the, what happens is, is this is EHR agnostic. It sits on top of your server. You do your work during the day, and it extracts the data at night off hours into the cloud, and then downloads it into the registry so you can see your performance and compare it to people in your own group, your subspecialty, or national benchmarks. So, so that leads to, Bill, how do I know which of those EMR vendors that are on the floor that are you know, selling product around the country, <laughs> how do they, we know whether they sync with Iris Registry or if um, they're a non-viable alternative for this inner, inner, innovation? Mike? Well, the EHR vendor that we're using, in principle, can sync with any uh, EHR that's out there. So the registry vendor uh, is really experienced at being able to do that. Now, that said, uh, they have done this with about 12 EHRs uh, so far. And uh, those are through pilot sites uh, that have been uh, signed up, different practices around the country. Uh, so there's a website, uh, www.aao.org slash iris registry, that lists the most current uh, EHR vendors that this has been done with before. And the list is growing. I think the important thing is this data belongs to you. You've generated. And we found that some EHR vendors, and I'm sure this was true uh, with ACC, they try to look at this and charge physicians. They don't do anything. This extracts your data. Um, and I think one of the questions you should ask every vendor when you go to talk to them, will you or have you integrated with Iris, and are there any fees for this? There should not be. What we found is that uh, very thoughtful EHR companies have said, oh my goodness, this actually will help sell my product if I can integrate the EHR into a quality improvement program. EHRs don't improve quality, the IRIS registry will. So we have a couple vendors now, right, Mike, that have actually incorporated, when you buy the system, the software is already installed. Let me come back to quality improvement in a second, but we have a question actually from the United Kingdom uh, which is a, a good question. Um, IRIS is at least being launched in US only. What's the future about international collaborations with this vehicle? Certainly it's not one that should be kept domestically. That's a great question. While we were developing this uh, over the last year and a half, we've had Friday calls for 18 months. Um, we have also worked collaboratively with our international colleagues. We've, we've contacted uh, Thalmic registries in Europe, Sweden. Sweden is actually now part of Eureka. The UK, South Wales, Malaysia, Aravind in India. And basically, we're looking at the data points that they have and they're measuring. And we're able to accomplish that, even though they're collecting data differently. So we, we do have the vision of integrating our results using different methodologies so we can compare our best outcomes for AMD, diabetic retinopathy uh, internationally. So we, that is part of our global plan, and we've had several meetings uh, with our international colleagues. Great. Let me ask, how do we take the data? Say I'm the practitioner in the field and I sort of want to look at it. How do I do it? What's my access to those data in the cloud so that I can actually achieve this laudable goal of continuous performance improvement? Go ahead, and, and you and Dave can probably comment on that best. Yeah. Go ahead. Um, well, the way that this works is that the registry vendor will send a report to each practice uh, and that's customized to the practice and to the physician that occurs at a regular interval. It's once a month, basically. And uh, that report will show how you're doing on different quality measures compared to different uh, practices, uh, for example, around the country. Uh, and in addition to that, uh, you as a practitioner would have the ability to go into the system and look at that in real time. Uh, there's a dashboard where you can look at uh, exactly those data, you know, how you compare for the different measures. So that would be customizable by physician interest, um, subspecialty, and so forth. Dave, you have a large group. Uh, I'm, I, I have a group of 11. I don't even know how my partners do. And do you guys use this to look internally at your own performance in your group? Uh, yes, and I can tell you that your partners do poorly, as, <laughs> as, as, as do mine. Uh, welcome, welcome to quality measurement. Right. Um, reports are uh, typically customizable by geography. Think of an office location, uh, by uh, provider, and uh, by uh, in some instances, even disease process. What occurs when you begin to receive data reports, uh, and, I, and I want to make sure that you understand that the concept of compared to your colleagues is what we like to do. 
I prefer to think of it as compared to what we ought to be doing, uh, which is a slightly different twist, but if you're as competitive as we are, you can't get away from that. You wind up with a very rapid learning cycle. Uh, you will see practices within months have improvements in their data quality. Uh, you will see practices make adjustments in the way that resources are spent if they have a particular location that doesn't seem to be doing as well uh, as some of their other locations. Uh, so that it is a very rapid process of learning. Uh, it is a very much quickly assimilated into the practice uh, feature. We do sit at our doctor's meeting with that painful experience of here's your report, here's mine, and this is the way we're doing. Uh, but it is a very useful feature. As soon as the shock of that goes away, there is tremendous engagement. I will predict that those of you in multi-provider uh, practices will see an engagement of your providers that you have not seen before. So report card day will be lots of fun for some. Yes. Paul? And just as part of that overall process, knowing our colleagues, the first thing that's going to happen when we see the data is somebody say, well, the data's not right. <laughs> so there will be a process because there may be... Well, my patients are sicker. Yes. <laughs> and there may be elements of data that are in different fields. And so there is going to be an iterative process with the data integrator in your office to make sure that all the right fields are being looked at. But once that's done, then we're into the phrase that Dr. May is talking about. I think the important thing is, is uh, that this is really risk adjusted. We should be really tired of being compared uh, on a, in a blanket way. Uh, Paul as a glaucoma specialist has higher resource use, more complications than my patients as a general ophthalmologist. We will be able to stratify and risk adjust so that Paul's redos in African American filters will actually be compared to mine. So it won't be gross outcomes. They will be truly risk adjusted. Great. Um, so we have government programs and one of the go advantages of this that was um, mentioned in the initial uh, opening remarks by Dr. Park was, gee, this will help us deal with PQRS and value-based purchasing. So how does that happen? Very simply, uh, the Academy really looked at what the total value proposition is to get members to really look at the IRIS registry, not only for quality improvement, but the government has listened to the economist, Ellen Kruger, a former head of the economic advisors and the administration. They believe that small cuts change human behavior much more than bonuses. We all have heard stories of guys uh, you know, winning the lottery and they're back in a trailer park in five years, uh, but small cuts make a huge difference. If you look at the data from 2014 and you look at the impact on meaningful use, which uh, PQRS, the value-based modifier, all of a sudden you're looking at ongoing 5 to 7% cuts in payment in Medicare as far as, the, as far as you can see. And the registry, because of its ability to capture the mandated PQRS and the evolving outcomes measure, will actually enable you to avoid those bonuses. For the Academy, that's about, for, as a profession, about $300 million a year. And uh, just do the math. So there's tremendous financial stimuli to participate in it. Also, the complexity of reporting is really getting ridiculous. We're going from, what is it, three measures now, Paul, to perhaps nine next year. How, and how can you possibly, as a department, or practice meet those. The IRS will handle the regulatory input for you. So yeah, and there's that a big appears advantage. to be if we have the nine measures even in 14, it's going to be difficult for anybody to successfully participate. Incidentally, those were penalties for $300 million um, in the future, at least. Money is risk. money, whether you lose it or gain it. You know? Yeah, whether you use it. So, subspecialists often forgotten in the opening of these big products. I guess, are there enough fields in the data set? that will, this will accomplish those goals for subspecialist care. Uh, Paul? Paul? Yeah, absolutely, because the fields are being designed in consultation with the major subspecialty societies. I've personally been on phone calls with members of representing the retina societies and the glaucoma societies, and other people have been doing cornea and neuroophthalmology and, and pediatrics. And so really it's a opportunity because it's based on 
the clinical data that's presented. It's agnostic, actually, to the specialty. We just want to make sure that the fields are being represented so we can pull them out for analysis. But you, you would run into a problem of too many fields, too much data to analyze, so you do, and some cost to every data element. And so I would view this as establishing, I think in our group, a framework that can be built up over time. And so the first generation set is going to be less complete than the subsequent generations, but we want to make sure that this is work and it's scalable. All I right. think the, the approach of the academy, and I'm sure this was true with ACC, this is not an academy, this is a professional function. And right from the beginning, we've had people from AGS, the retina group, the pediatric group, really looking at what's important to my specialty. I practice with three pediatric people, and the outcomes measures that APOS has put together under Michael and, and your leadership are really exciting to pediatric ophthalmologists. So there's been subspecialty input from day one. Mike, I think that's a really important point that Paul and Bill made that one thing we've learned from this process is that it takes so much effort to build up the infrastructure for this registry. But now that we're building up that infrastructure and it's there, we can use that to collaborate with a lot of other subspecialists so that everybody can take advantage of that and you know, of this big data quality improvement uh, type initiative. Yeah, so, but on rollout for four months from now or three months from now, is there enough data that everybody can successfully participate in, at least across our broad subspecialty that's a great group. question because for some specialties, we do not have PQRS measures, uh, plastics, neuro-op, and others. But the administration in the fiscal cliff legislation uh, created something called, what is it, David? A, a cl clinically significant data registry, whatever it is. And so if you'll participate in that and you report on your outcomes that you develop, even though they're not PQRS approved, you get a gold star uh, for meeting the, the requirements. Uh, this is in rulemaking. We hope to have the answer for you now. But that's the way the quality folks at CMS are anticipating this, that even though you have formal measures, if you're willing to participate in outcomes measures that your subspecialty develops, you still are going to meet all those regulatory criteria. David. Mike, let me make one comment to all of you who are practicing uh, providers as I am. I want you to understand the paradigm shift that happens when you participate because you need to communicate to your informatics leaders and to your registry leaders what you need from the registry. It's no longer a one size fits all. The data stream is dictated by them. Communicate with them, share with them your experiences, teach them the things that you need that are important in your practice because the registry evolves, morphs, is not static, and your input is vital to that improvement. I think that's a key thing. This is a static living thing. If you look, one of the things that we've done by waiting and learning from the leaders like ACC and STS is they've had interventional reg registries and they've had longitudinal office-based ones. For the first time, we're gonna be able to merge that data so with our registry, you're going to be able to take your interventions for cataract, uh, glaucoma filters, strabismus, and actually overlay that on the longitudinal care of the patient. So for the first time, we're going to be able to look at the impact of our interventions, drugs, and devices on the natural course of the disease. That's, what's, that's part of this whole step that Dave is talking about, about the evolution of registries. Well, let me go back to basics um, for one last time, though. Many of our members don't have an EHR. Can I participate or am I out of the loop on this one until I make that big purchase decision? Mike, and then I'll chime in. Um, there, is, there are ways to participate in the registry regardless of whether you have an EHR or not. Uh, but if you don't have an EHR, it takes more time because you'll have to manually enter those data fields in. All right, so, so for that, practical purposes, it's better with an EHR. All right, so it we will do have some large systems, by the way, in New York. Uh, a new, the largest system in New York does not have an EHR, mm -hmm. and yet they're going to participate to look at the surgical outcomes, which will be kind of web-based, like your mm -hmm. um, your uh, CPI. C that's right. We're coming. To so, Paul. And just one additional comment to this is the American Board of Ophthalmology, for all of the majority of our colleagues 
who are doing MOC uh, process now, is that the ABO has been working with the IRIS registry group, and so the data elements of the process improvement modules of part four are part of the data elements of the IRIS registry. So if you don't have an EHR, you want to see what it's like, if you do the new process improvement modules for the board, you'll actually get a flavor of what sort of data elements will be captured in the IRIS registry. Yeah. Back to um, privacy security, one um, questioner in the room has asked, can the data be subpoenaed to be used in a malpractice litigation or a malpractice claim? Who wants to jump there? We addressed that before, but to the best of our knowledge and making inquiries of, our, of other people with registries, and I think the FCS registry goes back to 91, 92? Mm -hmm. Correct. The answer is no. So at least to date, we know of these data not being used in any yes. adverse action against a practicing doc. Yes. Correct. Okay. Are they also um, available to the press? No. All right. Very good. I want to thank the panel for their participation this morning. This obviously begins the dialogue and the questions and answers. Uh, there will be many courses, discussions at this meeting and in are on the Academy website and presumably in print media as well over the next few months until rollout. Future additions and innovations will certainly be communicated as well in a timely fashion. I want to thank the panel as well as the audience and the questioners, including those from overseas, for participating. Thank you.